Which technologies are going to present the biggest opportunities and the biggest threats for your business in the next five to ten years? That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, I'm Mike Holman. I'm the VP of Research at Lux. So I help to lead uh, our team of, uh, of analysts, and I'm joined by my colleague, Cosman Laszlo. Hello, everybody. I am the Director of Research Products here at Lux, and in that role, I manage our data science team. So we're always on the lookout for new methodologies, new tools, new frameworks for how to better analyze emerging innovations and interesting companies therein. And we'll explore some of that today in this webinar. So we're here to present on the 19 for 2019, our selections for the top transformational technologies to, to reshape the world. It's just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, throughout the webinar, you can type any questions that you have into the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, time permitting, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can. But if your question doesn't get answered, please feel free to email to questions at luxresearchinc.com. And before we dive in to the, uh, the meat of the webinar itself, let me just tell you a little bit of background uh, about Lux Research. Our goal and our mission, what we get up every day to do, is to help our clients deliver on their innovation goals, to drive growth uh, through tech innovation. So our analyst team and our, our team of data scientists are, are working every day on research about and discussions with our clients uh, about key strategic questions like what's going on in 3D printing? What does that mean for, for my strategy in that area? Who are the companies with the best technology and solutions in the microbiome? And what's the right way to engage with them? What are the right business models to pursue? How's the automotive supply chain changing due to electrification? What are the geographic and, uh, and industry shifts there? And, of course, blockchain. Just wouldn't be a week at Lux if we didn't get to talk about <laughs> blockchain, one of the uh, most promising tech, one of the most exciting technologies, but one where there's a lot of hype. So helping to direct clients on what applications make the most sense and, and what ones are um, more a lot of hot air. Uh, and as far as how we go about that, Cosman, you want to speak to that a little bit? There's three key things that we will highlight as the Lux difference. One of the things I personally enjoy the most is the fantastic people we have working here, including on the research team, a lot of subject matter experts that have background as PhDs or master's degrees, so that if we have somebody who's, for example, interviewing a solid-state battery startup, they might have an electrochemistry background, so they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the CTO of that company. We also do a lot of primary research. We do thousands of interviews where we explore the technology, the markets, the strategies that companies small and large, employ uh, when they pursue these innovations. And lastly, we complement that activity, those technical experts doing primary research with advanced analytics. So over the past three years or so, we've had a data science team that works to invent new methodologies to help bring data alongside of the insight. Right. And you'll see that, that interplay between the, the, the analysts and the data scientists throughout, uh, throughout this webinar. So we set out to select the technologies that have the greatest potential to transform the world over the next decade to help our clients guide their, their research and innovation and, and, and planning efforts. And uh, to give you a, a quick rundown of the, the agenda for the, for the webinar here, we'll talk a little bit about the 19 for 19, the motivation and methodology behind it, um, highlighting especially uh, something called the Lux Tech Signal, which is one of the key analytical engines behind it. Uh, we won't really have time to go through all the 19, but we'll give you some of the highlights from the report and uh, a little bit of a glimpse of, you know, probably the part that we spend the most of our time talking with clients about is the so what. What, what do I actually do about this? How do I take action on it? Um, and then wrap up with a little bit of the outlook. So shall we get started? Let's do it. So I labeled this first section, why is this unique? Um, not just what this is, because well, what it is is technology foresight. It's predictions about what's happening in, in tech innovation. And those in themselves, in and of themselves, are frankly kind of a dime a dozen. So you can see a few examples here just from the first page or so of Google results um, that a lot of organizations, media, analyst firms, 
uh, have their own predictions for tech innovation in 2019. And somebody even had the same bright idea that we did to make 19 of them for, for 2019. But when you dig into the methodology and the approach behind a lot of these, you can see most of them kind of just boil down to asking smart people for their opinions, 31 successful executives, or looking kind of generically at business, social, economic, and, and tech trends. Um, some people don't even tell you what they, how, how, what's behind it at all. It's just uh, sort of words passed down from on high. And asking smart people their opinion is, is always good, but and can be useful, but the uh, the motivating impulse behind our approach here is that we think there's now a better way to do it. Over the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of advances when it comes to the technology uh, and the data sets that can be applied to innovation analysis. When we look at the global innovation data, there's now more than ever available. So we have publications, whether that's from conference proceedings or research journals, we have patents from all around the world. We have funding events that could be the venture capital community and what it's done over the past couple of decades, as well as government funding into early stage work. We also have unstructured text, news, press releases, analyst insights, and so forth. So a lot more of that available, easily available than ever before. Alongside of that, we have this emergence of better tools than ever to access and analyze this information. APIs have been pretty revolutionary in making it really very, very easy to transfer data back and forth between different platforms, different software applications, put everything onto cloud computing for easy to set up and scale infrastructure, and then on that, deploy machine learning algorithms, things like natural language processing that's specially tuned for topics related to technologies and innovation monitoring. Three to five years ago, this was not the case, but where we are here today, it makes for a really interesting um, kind of space from which we can build uh, what we're about to talk about. Yeah, so there's a lot of powerful data science now to, to, to deploy, but you know, that said, we're not now gonna go all the way the other direction and just you know, take whatever answer the computer spits out. Uh, we do think it's really important to have that interplay between data science and the expert insight. Um, and there's several reasons for that, right? If you have the, the people that have that expertise in, in solid state batteries or, or what have you, they can help you with the, the curation of that data and the right analytics, choosing the right analytics to use. Having that, that domain knowledge helps you, you look at the output and say, okay, this signal is something that's actually important and significant. This is maybe probably an artifact. Um, and then above all, and as I alluded to earlier, uh, to bring in the, okay, what does this mean and what do I do about it component is, is, is really important as well. And, and data science on its own isn't gonna give you that. So like we said, it's that interplay between the data science and the expert insight that we, we think really makes this, this thing. And we've you know, selected the 19 by giving, developing these data science analytics then giving them to our analysts to sort of make their final uh, cuts and selections and, and, and judgments based on that. And one of the key analytical, the main key analytical tool we use for this is something called the Lux Tech Signal, which we can dig into a bit now. Yeah, Mike, so let's open up the black box here and explain how the Lux Tech Signal works and why we built it. So our first goal was to have something that is an objective holistic measurement. Uh, this idea that in addition to having analysts with you know, gut feel come to the table to talk about the decision they're going to make, we also have data that we can bring to that discussion. We want to have it be transparent, be accessible, so that the advanced analytics and the analyst expertise can really be side by side, where the analysts can curate what the um, advanced analytics provides. And lastly, we want to calibrate it in a way that it's a leading indicator. So something that talks about the coming three to five years as opposed to something that merely looks backwards. So how does it work? You can see an example here of the Lux Tech Signal for a particular topic. That's the blue curve shown over here. And you can see along the x-axis, you have the past 15 years or so, and along the y-axis, something called the innovation interest. 
This innovation interest is a combination of different data sets, data sets that we have cleaned up, normalized, applied different weights to, and different transformations to. And those five data sets are all of the world's patents, all of the world's academic papers, a long history of VC funding, as well as government funding, and our own data. So this means the news, the insights, the reports that our analysts write based on their primary research. So we bring those five data sets together, and that gives rise to this data-driven analysis of how technology proceeds over time. So in this case, for machine learning and AI, you can see how it had a low level of background activity within academia uh, from about 2003 to 2013, and even far before that. But it was really kind of around 2013 where we had an inflection point. Um, a lot of this started to come to market, and we see the score today, which is the highest in our benchmark. Right, and what also what Cosman and his team have, have spent a lot of time doing is looking back at historical case studies and sort of validating that when you do see an inflection point like this, like you see around 2012, for machine learning, that really is a good leading indicator of um, commercial opportunities to come. So without any further ado, let's look at what the 19 for 2019 are. So as I said, we won't get a chance to get into all of them, but I want to share with everyone the, the list here. Um, and you can see we've, we have technologies across digital health, materials, and energy. Um, and there's also an indicator for each one of them, um, which uh, whether it's something that has risen uh, up the list or, or fallen a few places over the last year since, since we did this at the beginning of 2018. Um, and notably here, there's quite a few technologies that are new to the list this year as well. Definitely. When we look at this compared to the past report, we see a lot of new entrants. Um, the sphere of innovation is changing so rapidly where we see technologies like perovskite solar, like generative design, like blockchain, make it onto the list. These yeah, are blockchain on. Yes. <laughs> These are things that we've been tracking for a long time, but we felt that 2019 was the year where they are sufficiently close to a real world impact that uh, they have made our list. Yeah, and so as I said, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Feel free to type um, to type any questions. If you have a question specifically about, you know, why is this so high or that lower or why is this going up or going down or what happened to that? Why isn't, you know, this technology on there? Feel free to type those into the, to the Q&A box and we'll be able to get to some of them at the end. Um, so as I said, won't won't go through all of these in in detail, but I wanted to to pick out one to give you a, a bit of a preview of the the type of analysis we do on it, and that's the technology that rose the most on the list from 2018 to 2019, and wearable electronics. So for each one of these in in the 2000 uh, the 19 for 2019 report, uh, you'll see the description of the technology and the places that it rose up. Uh, or fell uh, in the last year, but we gave for each one of these the Lux take. You know that's the 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 important takeaways here from our analysts. So Hirose Kuruma is our 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 lead expert in this space, and he can tell you that wearable electronics are really getting more important now because they're moving beyond the simple fitness trackers or even the basic smartwatches that were really more an extension of your cell phone to something that you can really regard as a personalized sensor module. It's on your body at all times or, or a high portion of the time that has a lot of implications and applications in areas from medicine to you know, enterprise for, for keeping track of uh, workers or promoting worker safety to uh, uses in enterprise uh, or to uses in, in entertainment and, and gaming. And when we talk about what you should do about it, um, we really think that the big business opportunities here are in not manufacturing the hardware, but in using the data that that personalized sensor module is producing to, uh, to create new, new business models. And you can see examples of that, for instance, in health, where um, you know, Apple and others have validated that the, the sensors on their smartwatches can do 
a pretty reliable job of advanced detection of conditions, serious conditions like atrial fibrillation. There's other opportunities in enhancing worker productivity through, uh, through data that these devices uh, can make available. So that's the key way to, to take action on this item is through those data-driven business models. And alongside of that analyst insight, we also have the data to complement it. Uh, this LuxTech signal here for the wearable electronics highlights how around 2013 to 2014, uh, we start to see uh, all of the early kind of prototypes and interest begin to pay off with Apple, Samsung, uh, Fitbit, starting to bring to market some pretty compelling devices that resonated with consumers. Helping with that, we also saw a large investment coming in from the venture capital community, more than $1.8 billion over the past five years. So these are brief snapshots of some of the depth that we have on the subject. Um, Lux members are able to dive deep into this. We have an entire tech page on wearable electronics where we have detailed breakouts of patents, of funding, of academic papers, uh, of key players where we're going to explore this a whole lot more. But for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to keep it moving. <laughs> That's right, and a lot more of the analyst commentary on those on those pages as well. So let's move on to that to that so what. So you know we talked a little bit about for wearables specifically, or we could talk for any of these. What what are some of the the the, the relevant opportunities? But how do you look at a list like the nineteen for nineteen overall and translate that into you know how your company should 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 take action on it? And we so that's. As I said, probably the biggest question we get from clients about this about this kind of study, um, and there's pretty simple and not easy to execute on, but a pretty simple three-step framework that we that we use for that. Uh, and that's first of all to understand the relevance of each of these technologies to your business. Um, they're all important and they're all going to be transformational, but they're not all going to have the same impact on every company and in every industry. So, you know, for instance, if you're a packaged foods company. Something like battery fast charging, you know, maybe there's some uses for that somewhere in your enterprise, but uh, that's not going to be as strategically critical to you as it is maybe to an auto OEM that's uh, trying to build an electric vehicles business. So you understand and map the relevance of those technologies, then uh, invest and find partners. So build the capabilities that you have uh, that, that are going to allow you to, uh, to understand that technology and to be prepared to capitalize on it. Um, and that's, that's that find partners part in particular uh, is, again, where we work a lot with clients on helping them identify what are the startups or the other outside innovators that they should be partnering with, working with, may, maybe even investing in directly to help build their capabilities in these areas. And then finally, you know, once you have that capability, you're going to uh, set your go to put in place your your, your go to market strategy. Um, decide what the right uh, approach and what the right business model for um, for for commercializing or taking advantage of that technology is going to be. So, uh, as I said, this is sort of simple in principle, but not easy in, to put into practice. Um, so, we wanted to walk through a case study. Um, it's sort of a hypothetical one based on just our general research in this space. This isn't, you know, client confidential information or anything, of course. Um, but we looked at the automotive industry as a field that, as an industry that has a lot of, is going to be impacted by a lot of these different, uh, a lot of the technologies on the 19 for 2019, and um, where there's some really interesting strategic decisions that companies have to make. Uh, so we decided we'd build a case study uh, around Ford. Yeah, so to help us out here, Mike, to understand the relevance, we've set up this data visualization where it is a radar where we're going to place key disruptive technologies that are, might impact Ford or others in the mobility space. Uh, if you're closer to the center of the radar, that's higher activity. So if you get a five, that's the highest level of activity. And then... As you're further out, you know, if you get to one, that's the lowest level of activity. So we've gone ahead and populated this for the automotive space. You can see there's three main sectors that we highlighted, digital innovation, materials innovation, 
and energy. So within digital, you can see a lot of the technologies highlighted in the 19 for 2019, circled in blue, as well as some other ones that we thought were relevant, like LiDAR and edge computing. So that's the overall understanding of the relevance. And now we're going to jump in to the go that next level deeper with a particular case study. Right. So once you've mapped out the relevance, then you know, pick out these technologies one by one and, and look at investing and finding partners. And so the case study example of that that we can highlight here is, uh, is in graphene. So graphene is a carbon-based nanomaterial, has a lot of really interesting properties and a lot of potential applications in um, automotive as, as well as other industries. And Ford has actually already gone out and found a key partner here. They're working with a startup company that we regard as one of the leaders in the space called XG Sciences. And they're actually in the process, they'll be bringing out this year graphene foams in the F-150 and in the Mustang under the hood to help with uh, noise and vibration damping. Um, and that's a little bit more of an incremental benefit, but it's a big deal uh, for the commercialization of graphene. Part of the reason my colleague Anthony Schiavo will tell you that 2019 is going to be the year of graphene. Um, it's a big milestone, and I, I think importantly for Ford, it sets them up to uh, to capitalize on some of those bigger potential wins in in the future because they have now established a good supply and working relationship with one of the the leading companies in this space, and 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 are getting a good handle on how to to capitalize on this material. So that's an example of how you, you can invest and find partnerships in the 19 for 2019 technologies. Um, but then really setting the strategy to, to act and, and fully capitalize on them is, is, is the final step. And, and one of the most interesting examples and, and I think strategic questions in, in the automotive industry and I think in all of tech innovation is what auto OEMs like Ford should do uh, about last mile transportation, last mile mobility. So this is uh, one of the, the 19 for 2019 that really encompasses a lot of the a family of technologies that are now being used to bring people and packages to their, to their final destinations, ranging everything from self-driving car services to electric scooters to uh, package delivery drones, uh, even more futuristically flying cars. Uh, there's a lot of change and a lot of, um, thus a lot of threat and opportunity in, in this space. Ford's actually doing a lot in this area already. They've, they've kind of hit the, the fine partner stage. They've got a variety of partnerships here for food and grocery delivery. They've bought an electric scooter company. They've uh, experimented in a variety of different models for piloting ride sharing services. Uh, and even done some work in more niche applications like non-emergency medical transport. So they have a lot of the ingredients, they're building a lot of the capabilities, but how does Ford really go about building a business model out of this concept of, of, of mobility? Well, it's a challenging space for an OEM like Ford to be in because it's really the platforms that own the, the customer demand and thus a lot of the customer data that, um, that are, are some of the most uh, critical space companies in the space and that capture a lot of the value. That's why you see these extremely high valuations for companies like Uber and Didi and Grab. Ford, realistically, is not going to compete with these companies, right? It'd be cool to think about turning Ford into the next Uber, but if I were an executive there, that's not what I would want to bet my career on, on, on trying to do. Instead, uh, Ford can build on its own strengths by taking advantage of the data that comes from a lot of these platforms and a lot of these other partnerships that I showed to really build on that strength in making vehicles. Because the other aspect of this, this shift in last mile mobility is that the nature of vehicles is really going to need to change. Um, you can see that most clearly in, when you think about self-driving cars and what does the interior of a car look like and how does it need to function and be different when you don't have a driver, you don't have a steering wheel. Um, but other options like, you know, delivery drones or, or self-driving um, uh, delivery vehicles, 
there's a lot of different, there's going to be a lot of variety and a lot of different needs for customization and, and, and specification that are going to be very different from what exists today. And the companies that can be best tapped into the data uh, about those needs are going to be the ones that can um, be best positioned to make the right vehicles, have the right product mix, and kind of be the arms dealer to the, uh, all the different companies that are competing to provide those mobility services. So for Ford, you look at, or, or for your company, you look at understanding the relevance by using that, uh, that tech radar. You then build the capabilities by investing and finding partners, as, as Ford did in graphing with XG Sciences. And then you set the right strategy to act, as Ford maybe still needs to figure out how to do um, in the area of last mile mobility. And so with that, we're going to switch gears now to the fifth and final part of the presentation, which is the outlook. We want to leave you with a segmentation of the 19 for 2019 that aligns with different parts of your potential strategy. First, and perhaps most importantly, we have the current rock stars of innovations. This is, if you look at the trajectory over time that these technologies have had on the LuxTech signal, all of them share the characteristic of exceptional current performance in terms of their score. You see things here like 5G networks, genome editing, 3D printing, wearable electronics. These are technologies where you need to have a strategy, either to develop excellence on these yourself, or at the very least, maybe it's a defensive play for something that might disrupt your industry. Secondly, the category of getting ready for prime time, these are technologies that are a bit lower in score or have had a bit of a rockier pathway to where they are today. So things like generative design, perovskite solar, uh, blockchain even. These are risky bets. So you might wanna have a portfolio approach here to risk where you diversify your bets on these important, but a little bit further out technologies. Lastly, we have emerging bets. These are more long-term, you know, if you're looking out 10, 15 years, things like materials informatics and last mile transportation, where it's still very much an open playing field, this would be a great time to make some investments that could potentially pay off big down the road. Thanks, Gosman. We, we now have some time to take questions uh, on the presentation. Uh, again, type those into the, to the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and if we don't get to your question on this call, someone from Lux will be in touch after the webinar. Uh, so to start us off, this is a good one for you, Gosman, question about one of the, the, the trends in the 19. What's your opinion as to why solid state batteries went down by five points since there, there are so many companies uh, re really working and investing in this area? Yeah, energy storage is a really competitive space these days where the incumbent technology, lithium-ion batteries, has benefited from so much investment and so much activity during the past one or two years. And what that does is it makes it really tough for an incumbent like solid state batteries that are trying to break in. So the cost, the safety, the performance that solid state batteries need to prove, you know, that gets harder and harder pretty much quarter by quarter. Um, there's still a lot of it really interesting, exciting activity that's happening there. So we're not counting out solid state batteries, but this is going to be something that will take probably 10 to 15 years before it really starts to rival the incumbent for market share. Um, this, this person says, stupid question. I think it's not a stupid question, uh, but why do you put the set strategy after or invest and find partners in, in, in that sort of three-step process. Don't you want to have a strategy, even a basic one, before you invest the resources or, or look for those partnerships? Um, so yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think that uh, it is true that you do want to have uh, some sort of basic idea of, of where you're going before you set out and, and start looking for partnerships. But I think it's also important to recognize you're going to have, uh, you're going to learn a lot through those partnerships and through that capability building phase. And these are very dynamic and rapidly changing areas. Um, so whatever idea you go in with is, is probably not gonna be that similar to the, to the strategy that you end up 
um, going with at the end and, and really exploring that capability and, and, and figuring out the right business model is something that you should expect to uh, evolve. So yes, have an idea of your strategy going in, but recognize that that's going to need to change and you're really only going to set the strategy uh, after you, you've had the chance to build some of those capabilities and get familiar with, with that tech area. And um, yeah, so here's, here's a good question on the, on the tech signal. It seems like all of the tech signal traces uh, have an inflection point around 2013. So is, is there any explanation for this? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. That's something that we've looked at as, as well in, in studying these uh, for the 19, for 2019, but also more generally in the projects that we've done with clients for their individual roadmaps. And what we found is that when we study a lot of the successful innovations on the Lux Tech Signal, they all shared a common pattern. They all follow a kind of an S-curve, which is um, kind of an experimental data-driven way to confirm that something that people have been using for a long time to describe technological adoption. And so all of the technologies that we highlight as the current rock stars are at the peak of that S-curve before they begin to plateau. And so that's why they were highlighted in this report is because they all do share that common characteristic. And it's kind of remarkable that um, a framework is able to describe technological adoption that well. But we have seen that they all pretty much rise on a common scale that takes about the same amount of time and reach a similar level. Right. So it's sort of a we, we've done over 3000 technologies on the tech signal. Right. And it's not that all of them have an inflection point around then, but you know, we've, we've found that that's kind of a characteristic pattern is about a five to seven year lag between an inflection point and when the real commercial opportunity takes off. So that's why for the 19, we've selected mostly technologies that do have that inflection point about five to seven years ago. Exactly. Um, all right, so that's uh, that's all we have time for, but uh, and it'll conclude the webinar for today. We we will send the slide presentation and the recording out to all of the attendees on email today, um, and it, you will also get when you leave the webinar uh, a prompt to complete a survey about the presentation. So we really appreciate any feedback you can give us on that. It really does help us to inform and improve all of our our future webinars. But thank you very much for joining us, and, and have you. a great day.